And there are even people out uh, questioning whether it's possible to measure a 6.4 gigabit per second memory interface. But uh, yeah, we have a setup and uh, we definitely would like to show you there. Hi everyone, it's Judy Warner. Welcome back to this week's Ecosystem Podcast. Today I'm joined by Herman Ruckerbauer, who is the CEO of I Know How. He has a rich experience in memory design and implementation that I think you're going to learn a lot from. He also is a signal integrity expert and has a lot to say about how to integrate memory design into your overall design. He's also going to share a talk he's giving at DesignCon. So if you're attending, we give that information at the end of the podcast. Without further ado, let's jump into our conversation with Herman Ruckerbauer of I Know How. Hi, Herman. So good to see you from across the pond. Thanks for joining today on the Ecosystem Podcast. Hi, Judy. Thanks for the invitation. And it's an honor to talk with you today. And you too. So before we get started on our conversation about memory, can you tell us a little bit about your background and a little bit about your company, I Know How? Yes, of course. Uh, so my name is Hermann Ruckerbauer. Hopefully some of you or your visitors uh, are knowing the name already. And I'm uh, working since memory with memory since a long time. So I worked with Siemens, Infineon and Kimonda, uh, always with DRAM memory, starting with EDO memories and uh, internal circuitry analysis. Uh, afterwards, I changed to the application testing and I was happy with my job until uh, Kimoda went bankrupt and I had to decide what to do. And yeah, I decided to start my own company with I Know How, doing high-speed single integrity uh, consultancy for all kinds of different interfaces, uh, PCI Express, so serial links. But still, my main focus is memory. And uh, today I'm there what uh, Scott McMorrow, someone, someone noticed uh, in a keynote that he mentioned. In the past, I had the, the feeling I was secure in an employed job, and now I have the feeling of being uh, free, and uh, none of them is really working. So I still do a lot of work, uh, and free, free, freedom is not really what you get when you're self-employed. Yeah, I uh, echo that. They think you're going to be free, but you work harder. But there is a there is a level of freedom, so good for you. Well, let's jump right into the to the subject at hand. So um, because of your consultancy, I know that you're encountering some pretty pervasive problems around memory design. So what are the main um, sticking points and problems you're seeing with your customers that you're working with? So quite often I have customers approaching with, with uh, more or less the same mindset. So they are thinking that the design guides and the reference designs are the holy grail for their design. They would like to follow them uh, point by point. And this is just not possible. And so once they are looking a little bit more into details, they come up with, oh, I tried to follow the design guides, but it's not possible under my boundary conditions. And once mm. they... Uh, are going, going to be even detailed, more detailed there, uh, and checking the reference designs, I realized, oh, not even the SRC vendor is following his uh, design guide on his own in his reference designs. So they'd come up and struggle with, oh, I need to violate the design guide, but what is the impact on my design? How critical is it? What does it mean to the margins that I have if I violate crosstalk uh, dimensions or if I violate length dimensions? So what does it mean for my final design? And last but not least, uh, they realize, oh, yes, I check USB. I do a compliance measurement on PCI Express or SATA. But for the memory interface, I expect to work, work it, I expect it to work out of the box. So uh, I assume that there need to be some, done some testing too. And this is what my, basically job, my basic job is to help them uh, designing the interface, uh, checking the impact of design guide violations, but also then to do the verification of their designs in order to make sure that they're working under all circumstances. So why is it more difficult to um, measure the memory bus than it is for the serial links that are running at a much higher speed? It's not just a measurement, it's also design and layout uh, where a serial bus with a serial link is uh, somehow more defined than memory. Memory is the last dinosaur is parallel bus. So, and we mm. deal not just with a lot of signals, so 64 or 72 signals uh, on one channel, 
uh, but we also deal with the bursted bidirectional interface. So we have signals uh, transferring in both directions, uh, not at the same time, but uh, still we need to switch the, the bus. We are also dealing with point-to-multipoint uh, connectivity. So while serial links do have a point-to-point -point, uh, connectivity, on a memory bus there are two or even four ranks uh, connected to one controller. And on the fly by command mm -hmm. address bus, there might be nine or even 18 devices that are connected to one bus. And this makes the signaling really difficult. And in addition, the specialty, specialty of memory is the source synchronous uh, signaling that we have. So we have a DQS signal, which is a timing reference for all the data bus. And then all the data signals need to follow. And this is just a completely different topic or uh, implementation than people know from serial links. And so... Always since DDR2, um, or DDR, always since DDR2 or DDR1, uh, the memory design was difficult and it was driving the designs to its edge. But today, with the unit intervals of just 140 picoseconds, this is really crazy and insane, and it got much more complex from a training and implementation point of view. In addition to this uh, implementation uh, specifics, uh, we also have some very specific issues about verification. Because on a PCI Express link, you have a compliance pattern that you can drive and you can do a compliance test, which is defined by PCI SIG. But on memory, the memory is needed at is needed to boot the system. So it's absolutely required that the memory is working um, when you boot up the system. So if it's not working, you cannot analyze it. So this is one of the issues there. And there is no option to drive a compliance pattern. So we need to utilize what we get during normal operation. So we need to make sure that we can measure in a working system, uh, which is not the case for a PCI Express link, for example. Last but not least, uh, the memory interface does not have a system spec. It's only a device spec. So while PCI Express has the system spec with the com uh, card electric mechanical spec, uh, memory is really just a device spec. And it's really difficult now to verify the requirements of a memory inside the working system. So there are a lot of things that play together that makes memory interfaces much more complex than serial links. Really, Herman, that sounds like the perfect storm of, of issues and how engineers are managing this is sort of beyond me. So because we don't have time to, to, to go deep like you would in one of your three or four day classes, let's give our listeners at least a couple um, takeaways today. So let me ask you about what are a couple suggestions you could give to our audience that will help them be more successful after listening to our conversation? Okay. Um, I would start with one recommendation to really think about your design long before you're doing any design or layout uh, work there. So think about uh, or do a bus priority study. So check your board design and you're checking out what is the most critical interface that you have. For example, you might have an, a PCI Express Gen 5 interface uh, where you connect a CPU to an FPGA at 32 gigabits per second. And you have a USB 4 interface uh, where you have uh, 20 gigabits per second. In this case, most likely the USB interface is more critical. Even if it's slower, it's longer routing and it's, there's a cable involved in this one. So you would from a high-speed serial link point of, uh, of view, uh, give the USB interface priority one, the PCI Express uh, interface priority two. And after you have done this, then place the priority zero, which is basically the memory interface. And this is where you're starting it. So you're really starting with the memory interface because this is the most critical one on your design. The second uh, recommendation that I would have is uh, what I mentioned before already. Do not believe that reference designs are the best solution for the implementation of a memory interface. Take them as this is the worst case, just working possible solution for a memory interface implementation. I had one case where a customer asked me whether he should hire me to help him in doing his design because he has a reference design. And I take a look to the reference design. And basically, this was a really good example how not to do a memory interface design. There were oh. so many bad things in there. It was working in the lab, but I really doubt that this would have worked in high volume manufacturing. So um, following the reverence designs uh, is good, but make sure that you don't believe everything you see. Similar for the design guides. Follow them, but do not follow them blindly. Always 
consider the boundary conditions of your specific design. So board material, thickness, available space that you have can make a huge difference. So you have to, uh, you cannot follow the reference design anymore. And again, here uh, also the reference designs for SOC vendors usually do not follow their own design guides completely. They also violate the design guides. And the last recommendation is really to understand the controller functionality. There's a lot of training on the memory interface going on during power up and each controller vendor can implement this kind of stuff individually. There is no spec how to implement it. And therefore you should understand how this kind of stuff is working in order to make sure that you adjust your design, your specific design exactly to this controller's requirement. So there is a lot of things going on that is difficult really to learn just out of data sheets. Uh, and so what I really can recommend is uh, trying to spend the time to do some trainings, to go to design contacts and seminars in order to learn this kind of stuff. Hello, my engineering friends. Thanks so much for listening to this week's podcast. If you're enjoying it, will you do me a big favor and go like, subscribe, and join the ecosystem community? This will help me to go a long way to continue to bring you great podcasts like this one and more resources to help you grow your career. Thanks so much. Now let's get back to the podcast. Excellent. Well, I think that's really helpful as far as what to look for first, rather, and also... Um, right, to go ahead and invest in your own career with some training. So uh, on the back end of what you just recommended, so say you have what you think is a working design, how do you know if it's really good or not? That's definitely a good question um, because quite often I see in industry that people do not take that much effort uh, to verify their design that they should do. And this is where I am a little bit a burned child because I always see the non-working designs that I need to fix, that I need to do failure mm. analysis, uh, just because of, for example, the PCP vendor was uh, changed and afterwards the design is failing. And this kind of stuff can be avoided by uh, verification uh, checks and as you ask for it, so there is one thing that most customers do hardly, it's a functional corner case test. So you run a memory test uh, and try to ensure that it's uh, working under all corner case mm -hmm. configurations. But on corner case, most people just utilize temperature because it's a simple thing to put the system in the temperature chamber make it at minus 25 degrees, make it at plus 70 degrees, and then uh, verify that it's working. But corner case test means PVT, process voltage and temperature. And therefore, it's yeah. very difficult, especially for small companies, to get corner case samples from silicon. It's a little bit simpler to get corner case samples from PCB vendors. So you can define uh, just a more accurate uh, uh, impedance control, so plus minus 5%, and then you get low corner and high impedance corner. And voltage corner, this is something that needs to be implemented in the design. You need to make sure that you can vary the voltages that you're allowing, that allows you really to do a corner case temperature, a corner case uh, testing also for voltages. So this is the first part. It's just part of this uh, verification shop. The next one is verify the training results and the margins. As mentioned before, all controllers do a lot of trainings and usually out of log files, you see the results of these trainings. And it's not enough just to do a simple one board uh, in the system. You need to have multiple boards uh, in the lab and test them. And you need to run thousands of boots and ensure that all of them give the same and reasonable results. So you have to do a lot of uh, checks of these training results. And then you can figure out whether the trained ODT setting, the trained DFE, the decision feedback equalizer setting, and all the timings remain very similar so that you can be sure that uh, in high volume manufacturing, really all of your mm. uh, products are booting fine. The next thing is uh, to verify also that periodic trainings are implemented. So there are a lot of features or there are several features uh, on the memory that helps the controller to compensate, uh, compensate temperature effects and also voltage effects. And these drift effects uh, are compensated by the CQ calibration. So the output driver is calibrated during runtime uh, and will be adjusted if the temperature changes. 
Also, the internal timings uh, for the DQS clock tree can be trained during runtime. So ensure that these trainings are really enabled in your design to make sure that uh, such voltage changes or temperature changes are compensated. And last but not least, but the most important thing in my opinion is the single integrity verification by measurement. Because mm -hmm. the on die training result uh, verification is just giving you part of the answers. So you might see clock chitter in this sco scope measurement. You might see DC-DC noise. You see wrongly adjusted timings. So with the scope view, you're seeing a lot more things. And here I have one example from a customer that came to me and said, hey, I would like to have my memory interface um, validated. It's running fine. All functional tests have been passing. Then we just connected the clock and I said, there's something wrong. The system is not running. It was a DDR3 system at 800 megabit per second, but at 300 something megabit uh, mm -hmm. per second. And this is out of the DRAM spec already. And uh, then he said, no, that's not possible. And finally, it turned out that we had multiple issues on the board and some compensated the others. So for example, the termination resistors at the end of the bus had been set wrongly. It was a kilo ohm resistor instead of, instead of 39 ohm. But there was also a wrong uh, SOC solder on the board. And this SOC did not support the high speed. It just supported a lower speed. And with the configuration for the high speed design, the system was just running at very low speed. And therefore, the impact of these uh, wrongly dimensioned uh, termination resistors was not visible anymore. So uh, without really looking on a, uh, on a system without a scope, there can be so many things that you think you have said in software, but in hardware, it just looks completely different. It just sounds impossible to me, but I know, I find hope that there's <laughs> the Hermans in the world that will teach us, but I just think about it, it's <clears> not as an engineer, there, there's so many things to look at and no. it, it seems so challenging. It's not impossible, but there are so many signals to check and it's so complicated. You never can uh, test everything. You can't just uh, limit the risk uh, of a design. Uh, but I think to a reasonable low, low risk, but there is no chance to test everything. No way. So I have a question about your first point, Herman. You were talking about the different kinds of voltage tests as well as thermal and those things. Um, it's been my experience in the past that some of those um, tests are maybe available at your contract manufacturer, your EMS. Is that true in your experience? Yes, uh, especially on memory, there are not too many uh, companies out that can do this kind of testing. So it's a quite complex mm. stuff. And therefore, my recommendation, even I should not do this one because it's my business, but my recommendation is really to build up the know-how internally to have the scope, to have the test equipment and the know-how to do the testing. Because only if you have the know-how to do the testing and to verify that you can measure the margins, then you can really optimize your next design Your that might be or will be more critical. So don't rely on Herman, but uh, really get this st stuff done in internally as well. I think that's very good advice. I spoke to your friend, I think, Kisu Lee and Ben Dannon a week or two ago. And 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 uh, Hisu's point, and Hisu from Keysight, who is a memory expert who actually relies on you a bit. He's, I think uh, you and he see eye to eye. And he's like, the engineer is the secret weapon. You know, yeah. getting your knowledge, right? It doesn't matter what kind of devices and things you're using. It's about knowing how to drive and how to skillfully engineer. So you you and he, Sue, have come up with the same conclusion. Well, um, before I let you go, Herman, uh, first of all, thank you for sharing all this. And to your point, though, I know that you're doing some training um, at the upcoming design con. Can you share what you're teaching there? So if some of our listeners are going, they might be able to to uh, hop in on your class. Well, this would be nice if uh, if you would uh, meet somebody there. Uh, yeah. yeah, this uh, tutorial on, in this case, mainly measurement. So Isu uh, from Keysight is doing the simulation stuff. He is also part of this uh, design con tutorial that we have. 
in this case, uh, Ben Denon and so uh, with Keyside, oh. Randy White, and well, he's there you Sue. go. <laughs> I forgot that those two were part of your talk. So, yeah, a segue. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, we have a combined uh, session there. It's a tutorial, latest measurement techniques for next generation memory systems. And yeah, I have to admit, currently we are still working on it and improving it. Uh, we are going to show uh, the setup and the testing of a DDR5 6.4 gigabit per second interface, so which is even faster than what industry is doing today. Uh, so we are trying to really teach on uh, live uh, and say uh, and show live how we can set up such a measurement and how to test and measure the data and then also evaluate the results. And there are even people out uh, questioning whether it's possible to measure a 6.4 gigabit per second memory interface. But uh, yeah, we have a setup and uh, we definitely would like to show you there. And there is one more thing for the design con. Uh, we are just working on making a full document with a very good memory release process. So there are a lot of things to, to be documented and discussed. And all of this will be a guideline uh, that you can really do a solid memory release for your own company, for your own memory interface. So this one will be first distributed on design con. And later on, hopefully, you will get it also as a link from I know how or Keysight or maybe also from uh, from Judy as well. So this is definitely another reason why to go to DesignCon. Exciting. Well, for our audience, I will make sure and get that link and put it for you below if you're attending DesignCon. Um, and then Herman, I know you teach classes, so um, I will also put in your website, I know how, by the way, it's EYE, get it? Like a <laughs> like an eye on a, on a yeah, the, so the, the company yeah. name was uh, coming out of the past and people who don't know about signal integrity are always confused. Uh, why an eye? Why? You're not an eye doctor. <laughs> but people who know about signal integrity uh, like the, the naming. So therefore, I, I yeah. just didn't. The, the eye diagram. I was losing my term there. Well, Herman, thank you again so much. And I'd also like to invite our listeners to connect with us at the ecosystem because Herman and I are... Uh, having early talks about maybe having him come to the States and, and getting uh, him set up to do some 3D classes here. So come over and sign up at the double ecosystem.com. And that way you'll get notified when we bring Herman to town. So Herman, thank you again. I look forward to seeing you at Design Con and thank you for sharing all your knowledge and wisdom. I appreciate your time today. You're welcome. And I'm happy to talk to you and it was nice to meet you there online for our audience thanks so much for joining us today i trust you enjoyed this conversation and hearing from herman Reckerbauer. if you are going to design con just go check out the show notes i put lots of links for you there whether you're attending or not and thanks for joining us this week as we come back from holidays we appreciate you and remember always stay connected to the ecosystem <music>